Hey there, welcome to episode 40 of Money Never Sleeps, a podcast that looks inside the head of entrepreneurs and at what makes them do what they do. I'm Pete Townsend, your co-host of Money Never Sleeps, along with the awesome but still on the lam, Owen Fitzgerald. This episode of Money Never Sleeps is kindly sponsored by Ireland's fintech and financial services recruitment specialist, Top Tier Recruitment. If you or a colleague need help attracting or retaining great talent for your fintech or financial services company, we highly recommend you have a chat with the team at Top Tier Recruitment as they really know their stuff. You can find them at toptierrecruitment.com and tell them we sent you. I've known Meredith Moss, and shortly after she launched Finomial in 2011, a Boston-based regtech firm providing compliance-driven, investor-first, client lifecycle management. We were running down the same path for a while, and then we fell out of touch after I took a different route a few years ago. We finally reconnected over dinner when she joined us at the Adminovate conference in Dublin this year, thanks to Des and Alan at Fundrex. And after she rocked out on stage talking about becoming an entrepreneur, it was a no-brainer to have her on the show. So here we go with episode 40 of Money Never Sleeps. Here we go again. Welcome to Money Never Sleeps. We're here in WeWork Dublin Landings in the offices of our sponsor, Top Tier Recruitment. I'm Pete Townsend. I'm Paul Smith, standing in for Owen Fitzgerald. And we're on with Meredith Boss, founder and CEO of Finomial. Welcome to the show, Meredith. Thanks so much for having me. So you and I go way back, Meredith, um, and to right after you founded the business. Um, and I remember Matt Rager um, introduced me to Finomial and started talking about you. And Matt Rager was a guy that I worked with way back when, who's not returning my phone calls these days. So I gotta, I gotta find a way to, to get back into him because he's a great guy. Um, obviously, this is your first time talking to Paul other than seeing, seeing each other on stage at Adminovate, uh, the big conference that we did in January here in Dublin, where we actually raised so this is probably the first time you've heard this, but we raised 24,000 euro for charity that day. That's phenomenal. Yeah. And the speaker who was a beneficiary of the uh, scholarships was um, really impactful. Absolutely. Yeah, it was a great day. So 12,000 each to uh, the Trinity Access programs, which um, improves the quality of um, educational programs at the at second level schools, the secondary level schools, in preparation for getting kids into university, um, and then Basis Point, which is the investment funds industry um, charity here uh, that makes some um, excellent decisions on on where that money goes as well in the local communities. So that was a big uh, that, uh, big big news this week that we got that done. Um, but anyway. Um, you know, we're here to talk about you today, Meredith. So maybe just to get us started, give us a, a, a view into your backstory um, and how you got to this point in your life and in your professional career. Absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll tell you how, how I founded um, Phenomial. I had spent a good part of my career um, when equities markets were going electronic, uh, doing product management and um, building algorithmic trading systems and um, buy side trading platforms. And um, later in my career, I came to the alternative space. And I was astonished to learn and, and experience that the investment process for institutional investors coming into hedge funds and private equity is a completely manual process. So everything I had um, spent years focused on the S straight through processing, STP, and um, transparency, audit trail, um, speed, all of those things were um, just foreign concepts in the alternatives trading space. Um, Totally. And I was, yeah, I was, I was kind of lucky to be in a place where I could see how this um, problem came together from a bunch of different perspectives. Um, so I think client onboarding is really the core problem, but I didn't understand that to be the core problem at the time. Um, I really, I really saw it as a trading uh like lack of electronic trading, a trading. Yeah, company. no, I see that. I see that. And given your background in electronic trading, I see the angle that you've now, after all these years, what what got you going in this direction? That's pretty cool. Yeah, um, and so I was. Yeah, I was. I was at Credit Suisse Alternative Investments, and I saw these three perspectives. Um, Credit Suisse had a small fund administrator at the time, and um, we had just bought two hedge funds. Yeah. 
so kind of brought outside hedge funds in house to distribute to um, Credit Suisse private clients, and then there was a twenty eight billion dollar fund of hedge funds, which really represents the investor perspective on alternatives, and. All three of those parties were just experiencing so much pain and also incurring so much risk in their business because of this manual process. So that's the problem we first set out to solve. Okay. All right. And I remember again from from our friend Matt Rager, uh, when and I still can kind of see the picture in my head um, and of, of what it looked like, which was as we called it back in the day and online subscription document. For those that may not be in the investment funds industry, a subscription document is basically your application form to buy into a, a hedge fund or an alternative investment fund. Um, and But you, the, the business is, has moved on since then. That was just your original idea and the way that, that you, you know, your MVP more or less, right? That's exactly right. Um, that was our initial MVP. And you're so... Um, that's such a good description of the subscription document because really what, what we realize is that the subscription document is a new account opening form or a new client form. Yep. It's just a particularly complex case where there are a lot of challenges in capturing the structure of the investing entity. And there's a lot of unstructured data that has to be captured. So it turns out that that was the perfect place to start on solving client onboarding because we started with the sort of most difficult case. Yep, I get that. Um, and then just in terms of you know changing tact a little bit, Meredith, um, at the Admitivate conference, um, I do remember one of the, the the highlights of the day was was one of the things that you said about you know when you decided to make the leap and and to get this business started. Um, and I'm not going to repeat it. Um, I'll let you do that. But maybe just to share with the listeners, you know, your your uh, the the state of mind that you were in when you decided to to launch this business and and how long it took to get it off the ground. So it took me by surprise how much notoriety that comment got. I thought it was pretty obvious. You, when you're when it's time to start a business, you uh, wait until bonus season and uh, you leave the firm after bonus season and um, use your bonus to kind of keep your family afloat while you get the business off the ground. Yeah. Um, so that was. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think it was something along the lines of, you know, uh, wait till that bonus hits your bank account, walk out the door and strap on your seatbelt. <laughs> That's right. I think I said it better on the spot. Yeah, and then then nine months later, you know, sign your first client or something to that effect. Yeah, that that's exactly right. Um, and and was that the hardest decision that you've had to make so far in your professional career? Was doing just that? Oh, definitely not. Um, that was um, that was kind of easy at the time. I just I had so much conviction about it. I had wanted to start a company for a long time, and in the internet heyday, I was at one of the first e-commerce platform companies. So software to put your business on the internet, which kind of dates me. Um, but you know, I worked for a company called IntraWorld and we had customers like Icon Office Solutions and Disney and they merchandised their products on the internet. That was so exciting. And um, we had a shopping cart and business intelligence. The, that Those were the days. And, and wow. um Ever since then, I've been wanting to, had been wanting to start a company, and all the ideas were in the consumer space. Pe- people would come to me with their ideas and said, "Want to do this? Would you run it?" And um, there was never an idea in the consumer space I could get excited about. But um, but because of my experience in this in this space, I I just knew that it was a problem that really really needed to get solved. I think I had no choice really um, in becoming an entrepreneur because um, my dad is an entrepreneur and um, growing up, I, you know, see him come home every day, weight of the world on his shoulders. And he was um, so good to tell me all about his business and um, made me feel like he was confiding in me, kind of teaching me about business. And um, I thought, oh, being an entrepreneur is way too stressful. I would never do that. Um, but I, uh, the DNA got the better of me and uh, I had to do it. Yeah, I feel that. We've talked about this in, in past episodes as well, that no one in my family 
um, is has ever, I think, except for my my older sister, who's a rocket scientist. Hey, Jess, how you doing? Um, she is. She spent two years working for a defense company in California between the time that she finished her undergrad and then went to do her master's. Other than that, I'm the only one without a doctorate degree, and I'm the only one that uh, has worked for a corporation. It feels like, um, and I could could probably say that can say that outright, which is pretty crazy. And and looking at what I'm doing now, yeah, you do need to have that in your DNA. You do need to have that in your blood. Um, Paul, do you have any in your family from that perspective that, you know, people out doing their own thing? Um, I, I didn't know. My dad would have would have run a business pretty independently. Um, and I was an only child, actually. So I would have been brought a lot along to uh, a lot of business meetings and uh, kind of weekends away and all that kind of stuff. So I would have been always around that type of environment. Yeah. And I think my mom always says, apparently, one of the weekends I was away, I stood in the lift and started to charge people to push the buttons. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. So, it, it, was, it was in my DNA somewhere. Yeah, you're, you're, like, you're like the Anakin Skywalker. It's just the yeah. force was just in you. Oh, I'd yeah. do anything for a few quid. Yeah. No problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Needs some audacity. All right, good. I love that. Um, and then with, with your business, Meredith, with Finomial, um, the moment that you realized oh my God, this is actually happening and someone is paying me to solve a problem and it's actually going to be some, you know, annual recurring revenue that will set us up to really grow the business. When did that happen? I think, um, you know, the, the first few customers are so, uh, powerful. They have such a huge impact. Um, I think the thing that really drove drove it home that we had um, found a problem that was excruciatingly painful um, was our second customer that we ever signed was um, a global Swiss bank. And we were there, uh, they're still a, a, a customer today. Um, we were their first cloud application and they were using us for PII, um, the most sensitive information that um, arguably that a, that a bank holds. And um, the other thing that was remarkable about it was that it wasn't just um, the need that um, the, the drive for the bank to um, adopt a platform that would enable regulatory compliance. So you always got to love a business with um, that's a, a reg tech business because it's a must have, not a nice to have. Um, but the other thing that was um, so compelling was that they, their clients were pushing them to provide them with transparency on um, investor data and on transactions. And so it was so it was the trifecta. It was a Swiss bank adopting a cloud-based solution. It was um, a regulatory deadline that was forcing them to get a solution in place. And it was their their clients who were demanding transparency and an enterprise ap approach to client onboarding. Okay. Okay. I get that. Um it, was that kind of the the landmark deal, and and from that point, you know, the the tap was turned on, or did it take a little while after that for more to come? Um, it took a little while after that. Um, no question about it. We um, we had um, a big vision, and um, it took us some time to get the solution matured um, to make it. Um, as robust as it needed to be, um, and um, to get a uh, to get the process in place um, on our, on our side to kind of scale the business out. Okay, and did that? You know, th th you just mentioned your vision a couple seconds ago. Um, I've got my vision of what I think the the financial market the financial markets will look like in the future, right? And you know, I don't have a specific product other than myself. Um, and, you know, trying to find my place in that in that future. Um, but, you know, when you talk about your vision, is your vision for, for what the financial markets will look like in the future? Or is that based upon a, 
um, a vision for your product and, and, you know, what place that you, you want to be in that? It is really um, ultimately about the vision of what the financial markets will look like okay. in the future. And what it, it, it is broader than our, our product today, but it certainly kind of drives our thinking about what our product needs to do and where, um, where we need to go to, to serve the industry. Um, so, you know, our, our vision is something that, um, we don't talk about as much as we probably should. Um, but, um, we, um, Certainly, we don't talk about it publicly as much as we should. Um, but our vision is really around um, enabling a fair and transparent global marketplace that is free of compliance breaches. And those compliance breaches are really, um, you know, we're, there are a lot of kind of things about our business. Well, first of all, our business is unbelievably unsexy. This is back office. We're automating a paper process. Um, we've got lots of regulations we keep track of and that we uh, encapsulate in our software. Um, it's really not cocktail party conversation. Um, but we are driven by uh, some real meaning in what we're doing. Um, ultimately, all of these regulations, as much as we all um, uh, kind of complain about them, find them onerous. Sometimes they are um, seem um, ill-conceived, but ultimately the objective of all these regulations, specifically around uh, information that a financial institution has to collect about its clients, they're really um, designed to address anti-money laundering, um, tax transparency, so to fight um, global tax evasion, and um, all of the um, kind of thwarting the crimes that are enabled by, by money laundering. So, you know, it's not something we stop and, and think about or talk about a lot, but ultimately it does come down to human trafficking and um, terrorist financing and, um, of course, yeah. uh, the, the drug trade where, where it all started. Well, that is at the very core of it. I never thought about it like that. That's, um, that is visionary, dare I say. Oh. Thanks. Well, we, you know, there's a, there's this um, incredible human drive for fairness. It's, it's so innate. There's a, a YouTube video about um, it kind of that uh, brilliantly illustrates how fairness, how, how uh, innate the, the drive for fairness is. Yep. Um, and it's a, a video that shows uh, an experiment with two monkeys in cages side by side, and um, they are both being uh, fed grapes. So when the monkey on the left gets a grape, the monkey on the right gets a grape. This goes on for a couple segments, and then um, in the next round, the monkey on the right gets a grape, and the monkey on the left gets a cucumber. And the monkey on the right gets a grape and the one on the left gets a cucumber. And this goes on. The one getting a cucumber starts rattling the bars of their cage because it, this monkey knows that this is an unfair system and there's no reason that the monkey on the right should get a grape while it's stuck with a cucumber. So um, it, it's something that you're know, tapping into something um, that that we all feel strongly about and we we connect we connect with that it actually we all ultimately want to do the right thing and we want to make it easy for financial institutions to do the right thing too. Absolutely. And I think you, those two monkeys were my two older kids. <laughs> I, what, what I've found Meredith is that, um, you know, kind of releasing yourself from the, you know, the corporate binds that you do get to get closer to this purpose and meaning in terms of, you know, your, your, your day to day professional life. And, and sometimes that just becomes life and it's not professional and personal anymore. It's just, it's life. And having that, that greater sense of meaning to attach yourself to can, can be a real driver. It, that's pretty cool. Um, you know, what, what do you think in terms of, you know, we're, um, we're drawing some of this out now, but, um, clearly I, I can hear that purpose and meaning in your voice, but what do you think are some of the other personality traits um, within Meredith that uh, have been helpful for you in getting to this point? I think that um, it is just um, tenacity. Uh, um, that's the grit, the kind of um, not letting something go, um, knowing that there's there's got to be a better way, there's got to be a way to make it work. Um, 
it's uh you can't get discouraged easily um and um i think i've also been helped so much in that by there's a, an amazing community um in boston of software ceos who have been hugely um supportive um and also a, an amazing boston fintech community um so i'll uh, give a shout out to uh boston fintech and one of our board members, um, Sarah Biller, who was just named as one of the um, to the most powerful women in fintech uh, by Innovate Finance this week. Awesome! It's really, uh, that's pretty great. Awesome. But the, that that community and that support relates to tenacity because what people tell you and kind of remind you um, is that every successful business has had multiple moments that have been pretty existential. Like, are we going to make it through this? Are we going to make it through this next challenge? And um, if you have the vision and the conviction and you find a way to get through those really challenging times or periods, um, that's the secret to, um, building an enduring business. Um, but you know, it, I don't know that it ever gets easy. It, um, it always feels like you need tenacity and you need to keep pushing and you need to, um, believe and just be driven by, by that conviction. Yeah. Yeah. I, I get that. And we had, um, Graham Rodford on from Archax on the episode that just went live this week. Um, and you know, or last week at this point where we're, we're, where we're going live with this episode and he talked about his own competitive streak and his own, you know, uh, listen, I do have a vision here. And that vision isn't changing, right? And that if you can still see that there is, you know, a purpose towards marching towards that vision and going through brick walls to get to it, then just keep moving, right? Just do it. Um, yeah. as, as long as you don't run out of money in the meantime, which, which can, can, right. can always be a bit of a nuisance from time to time. Right. Don't run out of money. I mean, but that, that whole, the tenacity is, um, kind of, you get the strength to go through different challenges from a lot of different sources. And a huge source, um, for me is, um, the team. I mean, the, the team has so much tenacity and I feel so fortunate to get to work with this group of people where we have, um, very, tightly aligned on our values and what's important and why we're doing this and how we work together. And, um, that's an incredible source of strength. I just, um, I feel incredibly lucky to have this, uh, this group of people that I get to work with every day. And was that luck or is that the way that you hire? I think it's luck. <laughs> I okay. love to take credit for it. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe it's something about, um, about my approach or, or me, but I, I, I honestly just feel lucky. I, uh, there's something, there's something that uh, I think kismet about, um, about a, a kind of a group of people that just come together with a certain spark. Yeah. I had one of those. Um, it was the, the stellar running club back in 1999, 2000, before I left Boston for Bermuda. And we had this great group of runners all together. We had done the Dublin Marathon, the Boston Marathon. Um, and then I just left it all behind when I moved to Bermuda, but uh, stayed in touch with a couple of the folks. So I, I, I know what you mean. And sometimes it's just a point in time thing, right? And they say that every time that you double uh, your staff within a startup, that the structure, the performance measurement, the arrangement, the management style, everything kind of needs to shift and change, right? And that you, know, you have people at all different levels. Have you gone through any of those kinds of, um, you know, the, those types of hurdles yet? Oh, absolutely. Um, we were just um, navigating through one of those periods. Um, and like a lot of software companies, we've adopted um, – OKRs, this um, system that was started by, well, the, there's a, a great book um, by John Doerr, the, the famous John Doerr called Measure What Matters, yep. um, arguably started um, by um, many, uh, many greats uh, before him and, and really originated with them, um, with Andy Grove, who is someone who I admire um, in 
as as a business person and as a human. Um, uh, but it, it's I do think there's a lot of benefit around adopting systems and kind of creating clarity for everyone in the company about what we're measuring and why we're measuring it. Absolutely. Uh, the, the guy said, um, I was doing some work with last year at 11FS, uh, David Breer, he introduced OKRs into that business and um, they're doing incredibly well. So it's, it's, something's working there with that. And you just mentioned Andy Grove, which is quite interesting. Um, he was with Intel, right? Way back in the day. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And my buddy, Joe Godinho, who um, I robbed a list of 25 questions off of, and Joe knows I, I use them and I asked him if I could use them. It's what I use with any startup to assess where they're going um, and what their, what their business is right now. Um, and he, this guy, Joe, used to work for Andy Grove. Um, so the, the, there's hopefully a little bit of Andy Grove in what I do. Um, but that, that's, you know, maybe wishful thinking. Um, in terms of, you know, your, your, your support system out there, who, who is the person that you lean on the most, Meredith? Um, you know, I think it's impossible to, um, do a startup or be an entrepreneur without an amazingly supportive spouse. Um, and, uh, I'm just so lucky. My husband is, is amazing. Um, and you know, he, uh, I spare him the gory details of, of what's going on in the business, but just knowing that he has my back and knowing that um, he's doing so much to kind of make our family work and um, make sure that everyone kind of gets, gets what they need, um, me and the kids and himself. It's always, it's a balance in every, in every family. Um, but uh, I think it's um just a, an absolute necessity. I can't, I can't imagine doing this, um, without his support. I hear you. I, I hear you. I'm the same way. If, if, if I didn't have my wife at home looking after the kids and getting them everywhere that, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing. Paul, how do you survive, um, between yourself and your wife? <laughs> no kids. <laughs> Probably helps. We had a cat, but the cat died. So yeah, it's just the two of us. Sorry about Bus- that. Business is the baby now. So <laughs> sorry about that cat again, Paul. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> that was devastating. Um, just in terms of, you know, we're kind of at the point, Meredith, where if, if Owen was here, he, w- he would ask his favorite question um, in terms of, you know, what would people not expect to know about you? But Owen's not here. So I asked the question, what would people not expect to know about Meredith Moss? Oh, I have a number of wacky characteristics that uh, my team knows, uh, knows about. Um I have this ridiculous hobby. I call it a hobby, um, which is composting. I, when I moved from Brooklyn to Cambridge, Massachusetts, I thought I had moved to the countryside and um, got a composting barrel. So excited to be green and to not worry about having uh, rats in the backyard as I, I, I wouldn't have dared compost in, in uh, Carroll Gardens, Red Hook. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I, um, (laughs) one of my, uh, one of our customers, um, uh, is in, uh, Wisconsin and one of the folks there has a farm, um, outside of Milwaukee. And I told him about this passion I have for composting. And he said, but, but what do you do with it? <laughs> like, you don't have a farm, yeah. have a little patch of, of garden in, in kind of, um, in, in the densely populated Cambridge, but I care a lot about my worms and, uh, it's pretty amazing to see, uh, biology happen in, in, uh, my backyard. So, uh, um, I highly recommend composting. And now there's no one in the office who doesn't know about it because I bring all of the office coffee grounds home to my worms. It's an obsession. Okay, that there, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be loads of it. I, I was going to say I got into com- I got into composting about six months ago, but it's the composting bin that's in the kitchen that then gets dumped into the bigger composting bin in the back garden that gets then taken out to the trash for the the bin men to take away uh, every two weeks. So uh, it's just in in Dublin now we have these you know big 
brown trash cans that everybody should put their their composting in, right? So, you need uh, to go. but no, I mean, I totally, I, I can kind of join you in obsessing about you know getting the split of the 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 throwaway right between recycling those things that are legitimately trash and those things that should be composted. I'm right there with exactly. you. Exactly. I'm right there with you. I, my obsessive tendencies can be pointed in any and all directions. <laughs> Absolutely. And they generally de- tend to pay off well in business. So, um, yeah, exactly. Well, thank you, Meredith. Um, we're going to close it there. Thank you so much for coming on to the show. It was great to have you. I think we got to the crux of the matter. Pete, thank you so much for inviting me. So much fun to do this with you. Wonderful. We'll talk soon. Okay. Okay. Take care. Money never sleeps, pal. That wraps it up, folks. Thanks to Meredith for opening up her mind for us to figure out why she does what she does. Remember, if you or a colleague need help attracting or retaining great talent for your fintech or financial services company, get in touch with the team at Top Tier Recruitment as they really know their stuff. You can find them at toptierrecruitment.com. As for Meredith, you can find out more about her by checking out the Finomial website at finomial.com. That's F-I-N-O-M-I-A-L.com. And more links are in the show notes on moneyneversleeps.ie. If you like what you heard today, please subscribe to Money Never Sleeps on iTunes and leave us a review. Each one helps. For other media channels, go to the subscribe page on moneyneversleeps.ie and follow the links. If you're searching directly on iTunes or Spotify, Money Never Sleeps is spelled as all one word. If there's someone you'd like to see featured on an upcoming episode of Money Never Sleeps, drop us a line on info at moneyneversleeps.ie or get in touch on Twitter at MNS Show. As for me, I increase the odds of startup success. DM me on Twitter at Pete Townsend NV if you want to know more. You can follow Owen on Twitter at Owen Fitzgerald9. Finally, thanks to Conan Brophy from Create Sound for recording and editing this podcast. Till next time, thanks for listening. See ya. Mm-hmm.